Chapter 1, An Introduction To whom I write Before my time of existence, there was a woman named Christine Cotter, and she gave birth to her first child in 1977, named Paul. About ten years later, she met and later married my father, Melville Mybus. My father was a farmer just outside of Marie, NSW, Australia at the time, and had grown up in a small Lutheran community in Victoria, Australia. My mother was also of Christian faith and believed in one God, one heaven. She was told by doctors that she had less than 10% chance of falling pregnant, but at 6.06 a.m. on the 10th of April 1993, with the help of a vacuum suction cap placed on my head and the umbilical cord around my neck, my mother gave birth to a blue-faced baby, me. I grew up not far outside of Marie on a farm that my father, and for a time his father managed. We had sheep, chickens and harvested mostly wheat and sorghum. I remember if a sheep was injured or a chicken was no longer laying eggs, we would kill it, cook it and eat it. I was taught to respect the animals, but also learnt of their value, even in death. If an animal was ever killed or died that wasn't able to be eaten, then we would generally dig a hole and bury the remains. My understanding of the world around me was quite simple, and I was content with it, probably because I was raised with a strong faith in a loving God that made life eternal and also, I was just a kid. And like most, I wasn't interested if it didn't seem fun or exciting. Growing up, my mother was always caring for someone and made a lot of friends with people that it seemed everyone else had forgotten about. She would take me with her to visit different people at times, and she always kept in touch with everyone. She still copies every single birthday on the calendar every year of all different people, not just family. Sometimes, during special events at church, I remember she used to dress up in these old ragged clothes with Lola's staple to it, and run around while all the kids would chase her to grab a lolly. No one ever missed out when my mother was around, and I remember being so proud to have the lolly lady as my mum. I was a shy but inquisitive child, and have always been plagued by the curiosity of man's perception with definitive logic. One day before I had even started my school years, my mother and I were travelling home, and as I watched the trees brush past, I began to wonder about the world. So I asked my mother, Mum, if two people were to look at one tree, wouldn't they see it differently? Yes, they would, she replied. This question marked one of my biggest and most important life lessons. A lesson that I was not capable or ready to comprehend of the journey and battles to come. Chapter 2, Dreams, the Early Years and Pictures off the Walls At around the ages of four to six years, I began having these reoccurring nightmares that were unlike anything I had ever felt before. I would first awaken in a frightened trance-like state in the middle of the night, and then go to sleep in my parents' bedroom with them. However once I became unconscious, this time it was like being awake in another world. I was as light as a feather and began floating above the bed. Beneath me were my mother, my father and myself sleeping peacefully. There was no sound to be heard, nor sound to be made, and I saw everything with a blue tinge almost like I had blue-colored lens glasses on. But after a few moments of peaceful floating, there was a dark shadow in the corner of the room that I felt the need to stay away from. Within this shadow, red eyes in the shape of an owl emerged with the teeth and jaw of a vicious canine. Dark tan skin like a small ape with wings like a giant bat and the tail of a serpent. Once I notice him, he grabs me, and we wrestle for a few minutes while floating in the air before he gets a grip on my throat and squeezes the air from my lungs. I would desperately try to scream at my body laying beneath me or my parents to wake me up because I knew it was a dream. But every time I tried to make a noise, I could not. I remember feeling like I was choking every time, like my face was red, and when I would wake up it felt like I hadn't breathed in a long time. This happened quite a few times over the period of a few years. By the end, I felt like I knew what to expect and would try to prepare myself or change the outcome, but I couldn't. 
Eventually the demonic dreams that haunted me stopped occurring, and in the year of 1999 I started kindergarten at what was then known as a small, private school that had much less than 100 students in total when I first began attending. I was quiet and innocent as a child, but also misunderstood. I remember I got into trouble once for playing to rough with a toy that I had brought to school for show and tell, and I was told to sit on the step for five minutes during lunch. The only problem was that this was my first year of school and I couldn't tell the time. So I had no clue how long five minutes was meant to be. I remember trying to ask a few older kids walking past, excuse me, do you know if I've been here for five minutes? I would say, but no one would answer and probably had no idea what was going on anyway. So I ended up sitting that lunch out for what would have been 40 minutes instead of five. Another classic example of my younger self from about the same time was when I was being taken to school on the bus one morning. I was very quiet on the bus, it took about 30 minutes of traveling from my home plus 10 to 30 minutes of dropping everyone off, depending where you were on the driver's destination list. Anyway, one time during my journey to school the bus driver dropped off every kid on the bus except me. I remember thinking there's no one left, it must be my turn. However the driver went back to another school and got out. I assumed maybe someone needed to get picked up quickly, so I patiently sat in the middle row of the bus for just over an hour before the bus driver came back. However, I still did not speak up and still assumed maybe there is an explanation. Eventually, on the bus driver's journey out of town, heading home, she notices the top of my spiky hair in the revision mirror and was immediately shocked by the realization I was still on the bus. It didn't bother me though, she wrote me a note that I would consider an absolute legitimate reason for missing two hours of English class. All I had to do was be my shy and quiet self. I remained that quiet and shy kid throughout my primary school years, and I was very afraid of doing the wrong thing or getting into trouble. I remember when I was in the third grade, another student in my class asked to go to the toilet, and they got absolutely yelled at and threatened by the teacher. We were often told that we could only go to the toilet during our free time at lunch, otherwise we were wasting our teacher's time. Unfortunately for me, I also had to go to the bathroom, but after the lecture and abuse that I just heard the other kid get, I knew it wasn't going to be any better for me if I asked the same question. So I held it in, literally twisting my legs and tightening the muscles in my face as I took up my work 20 minutes later to be marked. The teacher wasn't very impressed with my writing efforts, since she gave us the task of writing a story at least half a page long, and my story, which I desperately wanted to finish so that maybe I could go to the toilet, consisted of about five lines of the word very. My story went something like, it was a very, 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 very hot day, and the clouds were very, 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 very dark. So apparently that was cheating, and I had to rewrite most of it. By the time I rewrote it all and returned to the teacher, I was literally holding the pee in with my hand tightly gripped and could barely hold still for a moment. The teacher even asked me, do you need to go to the toilet, Dean? And I anxiously replied, no miss, not at all, in a fearful tone. I had not forgotten about the last kid that asked, and as she yelled at me now, there would be no need for a toilet anymore. Luckily, moments later the bell rings, and I started running as fast as I could for the toilets, which was a big mistake because the moment I took off, so did my bladder. I remember trying to just run as fast as I could, but the relief was too much to hold back in, and by the time I reached the boys' toilets, it was too late. I had pissed my pants. I did my best to hide it for the rest of the day. I think only a few of my friends may have noticed, but I made sure the teacher didn't find out. By the fourth grade I had developed an appreciation for the anime TV series, Dragon Ball Z, of which I had many pictures posted all around the interior of my bedroom walls. I was a big fan of the supernatural anime fighting, and it was probably what caused my interest for karate, which I had started attending classes of, at the Marie PCYC. Unfortunately, 
My family was still concerned about my past nightmares and possibly other relating issues at the time. So a pastor was invited to come visit and pray for the house. He was a minister at the church my grandmother, mother's side, attended and his wife was also a minister and a teacher at my school, which was now transitioning its name. Anyway, this man came out and possibly said a few words while walking around the house before entering our home and coming into my room. His first reaction was, ah, here it is. These images are gateways for the demons of hell. It was like suddenly it seemed obvious to him. He then instructed me to remove each of my childhood pictures so they could be taken outside and burnt immediately. My mother managed to save the portrait of me and my brother. I was never allowed to hang any anime artwork on my walls again. Chapter 3, Grade 5 and 6 Time went by and I started to develop my own interests. I had been attending freestyle martial arts classes at least once a week now for a while and would travel around the state to compete in tournaments. Another interest I started developing was music and the guitar. My brother now lived in Newcastle as an aspiring musician and he purchased a three-quarters sized acoustic guitar that was gifted to me the previous Christmas. It took a while for the interest to settle, but after about a year I was playing Smoke on the Water, Eye of the Tiger, and all those classic riffs we love to hate. My brother and I were very close, we would write each other letters, and whenever I would visit he would take me to Time Zone, a multiple gaming arcade venue. He also introduced me to a lot of bands that would inspire me throughout life. My first heavy influence was from the band Metallica. I purchased the album Kill Em All when I was in grade 5, and I loved every track. I became a big fan of every album up until the Black Album, and the first entire song I ever learnt on acoustic guitar was Nothing Else Matters by Metallica. When I competed at the ISKA tournaments or various other sporting events, often in the categories of musical kata forms or musical weapons, I had become known with a few common song choices such as Chaos AD by Sepultura, Bring Me to Life by Evanescence, Scum of the Earth by Rob Zombie and Fewer Fry by Ramstein. By the end of grade 5, I was elected and awarded primary school captain for grade 6 but it was an honor that demanded a perfect student that would represent the school. I remember feeling at times the pressure was too much, and I would come home crying and telling my parents I wanted to give it back, but they would encourage me to do my best and I'll get through it. The problem wasn't so much the stuff I had to do, it was the fact that if I did anything wrong then I got double the punishment, one for the crime and one for being a leader that did the crime. I wasn't really a bad kid, in fact the things that I got in trouble for at this time would probably be seen as minor by most people. For example, during some free time, all the students were allowed to write or draw on the whiteboard. I'm not sure why, but I started writing down some of my favorite Metallica songs, and I think it was the instrumental track title To Live Is To Die that got me into trouble, although it was difficult to clarify most of the time what I did wrong. Another example was when the class were playing a memory game, and we had to take turns in a circle at naming something that began with a letter, ascending through the alphabet, as each student would try to remember every word chosen before them. Anyway, very early into the game, it's my turn and I'm up to the letter C. I've already gotten the first two words and I awkwardly open my mouth to say crab, but then all of the children start laughing. I had no idea why but who cares everyone thought I was funny, great times. Anyway, it turns out the teacher and everyone in the class except me thought I said crap, so I had to stay back a while for that. I remember trying to tell the teacher. I had no idea that's what everyone thought I said and how I was meant to say crab, but she just told me to stop lying or I'd be further punished. Another incident with the same teacher was when I pointed at a dripping red painted cross or crucifix, and I said, whoa, look at that bloody cross, obviously. I was misunderstood as intentionally swearing rather than its descriptive reference to the red blood as being bloody. There were two words that I was always allowed to say when growing up, but couldn't understand why the school considered them so bad, 
they were bloody and bugger. By around the middle of grade 6, in the year 2005, I was awarded the black belt in freestyle martial arts from a local teacher, and would go on to receive my black belt in Shaolin Temple Monkey Boxing and Gold Sash in Eagle Claw or Wushu, more officially the following year. I also remained committed to my role as school captain with the support of my family, and at the end of the year, I was awarded Ducks of Primary School. It wasn't an easy journey, but I felt like I had earned every single thing I achieved, and that felt great because there was no doubt in myself at that time. Unfortunately, I had conflicted emotions about the future, I knew it was going to be exciting and different, but I also knew it was going to be much harder work, and higher expectations. Another issue that started developing at the time was my sensitivity to my weight, which had been made known to me by a few kids at school. So I didn't eat much during the end of 2005 till the start of 2006 in an attempt to shed some fat, and it actually worked for me at the time. I lost enough weight to be considered skinny by my peers by the time I started high school, but it took a lot of suffering and determination. I also had an incident when one night I thought I could see a floating ape-like head on my computer desk. It bothered me quite a bit at the time, so my parents called out that good old pastor again. Luckily, this time he stuck to prayers and didn't burn any of my stuff. They may have also called out a Lutheran minister as well, but it didn't really help or do anything. In fact it probably made me more anxious, with more questions about everything and everyone, but I got through it and managed to start high school feeling like a new and inspired person. Chapter 4, Grade 7 I started high school in the year of 2006 and had plenty of new friends that had graduated from one of the public primary schools in the area. I was skinny, had long black hair, and I felt very popular amongst my school peers. I remember we went on an excursion in the first term, which was great because there were quite a few new students in the class that I didn't know very well. I made plenty of friends, but the closest friend I made that year who would still remain a friend throughout my life was a guy named Brad. One of my earliest memories with Brad was on this excursion, there was a girl that I liked and another girl that he liked, so we decided to help each other get the girl since he knew the girl I was into from his previous school, and I knew the girl he liked. I remember getting the sense that he didn't like the girl I was trying to get very much, which was funny because I didn't like the girl he wanted either, after all, she was my main opposition for ducks of primary last year. So we were sworn enemies. Regardless of our own opinions, we decided to help each other with advice, knowledge, and borrowing clothes to present a different appearance. I'll never forget the clothes Brad lent me. I wore these baggy three-quarters length jeans, a loose t-shirt, I think maybe a chain necklace, and a bulky pair of basketball or skate shoes. This wasn't anything usual for me to wear, so I'm pretty sure I stood out, and a few people may have wondered what was going on. Looking back on it, I think in reality I just made Brad look like me, and I looked like Brad. It was still fun though, I don't think either of us got the girl, and to be honest I can't remember anyway, but without even realizing at the time, I now had this great memory of someone I still call a friend to this day. Unfortunately, I don't think my teachers liked the influence I suddenly had amongst my peers, and I didn't exactly align with their profile of a good Christian boy anymore, especially one whom they had chosen as a leader. I didn't suddenly change really as a person on the inside, I just looked different on the outside. I started liking black clothes and for my 13th birthday, that year I was the boy that wanted a hair straightener. I also was introduced to another band by an older female student that had started dating one of my school friends since primary. My life had been changed forever when she showed me the mask-wearing metal band, Slipknot. They looked much scarier and seemed heavier than Metallica in a way, but my main attraction was my own perception of the screaming vocals. There was so much raw emotional pain that I had never heard before, and I loved it. Pretty soon, I started getting into trouble for a lot of stuff, mostly things that I had no involvement in. 
I was always given an inner school suspension, so they could control the level of punishment, rather than just send me home. Being on inner school suspension for me, meant as soon as the bell rang I had to report to the office. I was then given a small table in the corner near the principal's office, and had to do endless amounts of homework. What annoyed me though was the tricks they would play on me, as the teachers that gave me work would always promise a reward if I could finish all the work in time. So I would race through it as fast as I could, but the reward was always more work. I never got recess, and was completely isolated from the other students, if any student tried to say hello to me they would be threatened with detention. I was given five minutes after everyone else had their 40 minute lunch break to quickly eat what food I had near the office, and then go to the bathroom. That was the only break I was given, then it was back to work, which I always did. I remember one of my coping strategies for when time was going really slow was I'd imagine a song by Slipknot called The Nameless. That song must have played in my thoughts more than 100 times, but it helped me through my times of isolation. The school had some weird ideas, especially when it came to enforcing their rules. Like there was the time when someone in the school smeared poo on the walls in the boys' toilets. I never saw what happened, but every single student was punished until someone owned up. It was a pointless tactic, because whoever actually did it surely wouldn't admit it in front of everyone. But after three days of missing class, while we were all crammed into a small area outside the church hall, one of the older students took the blame and received further punishment so everyone else could go back to class. I started getting into trouble more and more as the year passed by and was labeled a bush lawyer and devil's advocate by my teachers because I started to question their judgment. One of my first inner school suspensions was because a girl had stolen my school bag and refused to tell me where it was. So I decided to play fire with fire and I took her bag and said I was willing to trade. The girl refused to tell me where my bag was and started getting very angry at me. So I threw her bag under the building where I could guard it until she returned my bag. However, she decided to go to the class teacher and complain, I remember thinking how stupid that was because she started it anyway. Unfortunately when the teacher arrived, the girl also returned with my bag and so I crawled under the building to get her bag back and returned it to her. The teacher for some baffling reason wanted me punished though, so I was given a four day in a school suspension whilst the other girl received no punishment. Then there was the time we had an art assignment in grade 7, and we had to make a 3D cardboard representation of pretty much anything. I was fascinated by angels and demons and knew that some of the teachers had high expectations of me so I thought that since this was a religious school that preached if we are bad we will burn in hell for all eternity. I assumed an artistic representation of hell might help me win back the support of my school teachers. I went to so much effort to cut out red flames and draw little figures in the fire. I remember how excited I was on the day I took my art project to school, I thought maybe they would see I was trying. Instead I was given three days of inner school suspension for my artwork, and when I was told to go to the deputy principal, I replied, this is bullshit. They added another two days to my suspension for swearing at a teacher. By the middle of term two, I was getting sent to the deputy principal at least once a week, and he would always punish me with another inner school suspension, but would never listen to my rational claims. It started to feel like a trend amongst the teachers, or like they were trying to set me up at times. There were a few main teachers that seemed to be out to get me. I remember one of the oddest experience was when I could not have possibly been faulted. I was quietly doing my work, and I could hear other people whispering, but I was determined to not get punished. Suddenly our teacher yells out, that's it Dean, go to the deputy. I was quite startled and confused by what I thought I had heard so I just waited and assumed maybe she will correct herself, surely there's a mistake. The teacher then stood up and yelled again, Dean I told you to go to the deputy principal. I then spoke up in a dry croaky voice, what? Why? And I even remember a few people in the class tried to defend me and said he didn't do anything. 
The teacher's response was that I had been talking in class, and it was disruptive. A few students continued to defend my claims, and one student even said, no miss, that was me. I remember feeling really good for a moment, because during that moment I had support from my peers, and even people, that I didn't think liked me very much. It didn't change anything though, the kid that was actually talking, and admitted it was ignored, whilst I received five days of inner school suspension for being disruptive in class. I had strong beliefs in God and Christian values all of my life, but when I started to feel like I wasn't allowed to belong to anything or even anyone, that's when I turned against everything I knew, and it all started at one assembly that year. The entire school would stand on the grass in front of the office every Wednesday morning to sing the national anthem, and hear announcements, etc. This morning assembly went on as usual, and we got to the principal's announcements. He looked up at the sky and said, there is evil in our school, and it is being forced on others, he then lowered his head looking directly at me and said, isn't that right Dean? I still remember the laughing faces of all the students, and have often written about it in the lyrics of my music. Still to this day, the only reason I can make sense of his forced on others part of the statement was how recently on a school open day I wore a Slipknot band t-shirt, but everyone was allowed to wear their normal clothes that day and besides, it was another student in the school that introduced me to that band so even that makes little sense. But that moment, the laughter and the feelings of hopelessness never went away from that day, it felt like it lasted forever and sadly, it does. Chapter 5, Grade 7 PT, 2 Chapter 5, Grade 7 PT, 2 I started to develop a deep hatred for some of the teachers at By the third term of school that year, I was suspended at least once every week. I remember we had school photos one day, and the whole started to develop a deep hatred for some of the teachers at my school, and would come home very angry or distressed. At the time, my parents didn't believe me, they had been called into the school a few times, and assumed these teachers had no reason to lie. So I was pretty much alone, desperately trying to prove myself to everyone. The only people that knew the truth were my friends, but they were just kids that could easily be disregarded by a more mature and educated person. To help relieve the anger, I started cutting down trees on my father's property with an axe. As soon as I got home from school I would grab an axe and swing it for one to two hours straight. I had pink, blistered hands from chopping down trees and one tree even took me a week to finish, but I felt so angry at the time, it was like I couldn't feel anything else. I somehow managed to continue with multiple styles of martial arts training and remained very disciplined mentally during class. I had been training with 10th Dan Black Belt, Master Zach Walters whom awarded me my black belt again, and Gold Sash in Wushu. The training was fairly intense, from memory, there were about five days of fitness training and five days of learning kata, and a weapons kata. At first I was excited to get through the fitness training and thought the hard part was over, but I was wrong. The kata training meant not only learning a sequence of moves, but having to repeat each move and hold each position to a point of perfection for up to a few minutes. By the end of the kata week, I had pivoted my feet on the same spot for that many times, they started to blister and bleed on the wooden floor. It was brutal in mind, body and emotionally, but it also meant I earned my black belt and gold sash. I was also a student of an old traditional Japanese form called Yagahu Shinhen Ryu that was heavily involved with katanas, swords, and even went to a kickboxing class for a few months. By the third term of school that year, I was suspended at least once every week. I remember we had school photos one day, and the whole class was lined up for our yearly photo. When we were finished, the teacher decided we should all look silly for a fun photo. I watched wrestling on TV as a kid, and my favorite was always The Undertaker. He would often roll his eyes back to make them look purely white, and I had practiced that much as a kid, I could do it too. Another student in my class, 
suggested that I roll my eyes back while he pretended to choke me. The photo was taken and it looked just like we imagined, with his long fingers gripping my throat, and the white of my eyes clearly displayed. I'm not sure if someone complained or they just didn't notice at first, but the photo was on display at the school office for almost a week before I was given a five-day in a school suspension for looking evil, and the guy that came up with the idea and even tried to defend me by telling the truth was given no punishment. I think my mother started to question the word of the school when I was given an inner school suspension for making a slideshow on the computer and she was called in again. My animated slideshow consisted of a short story with stickman figures and one pulls out a stickman gun and shoots a little line at the other. The deputy principal acted like I had literally killed someone and went over like a broken record that made no sense because I couldn't comprehend how another student in the class was allowed to have cartoon porn in his slideshow that involved Mickey Mouse, Goofy and other various characters all having an explicit gangbang with each other. But stickman violence is not okay. We weren't even allowed to learn about sex education. But when the teacher saw the pornographic material she just quietly told the student to delete it. I was given four days of inner school suspension for that 30 second video. It was then that I started to rebel and made the conscious decision, if they think I am evil, then I will become evil. I started carving the school desks with quotes like sons of Satan or kill the Christians and it didn't take long before I was caught. I remember the deputy principal called me and two or three other suspects into a room and we were told to write most of the letters of the words used so he could compare the writing styles. I didn't even try to disguise my handwriting. I knew I was getting punished either way, and when the deputy spoke to me alone after the confrontation, I busted out into tears. I remember losing my sense of control. I was so lost and sad, and I just couldn't stop crying. I desperately tried to explain how much it hurt, but I wasn't there to say sorry. I was there to be punished and so I was given another week of inner school suspension. I think it was around this time, my mother took me to my grandmother's pastor and his wife's home. They lived in Marie, not far from the golf club at the time, and although my mother doesn't remember this, I could still paint a picture of the room in my head. As I walked through the front door, there was a lounge room to my right. I took a few steps forward and I was in the dining room with the kitchen beside me on the right. The table and chairs that I sat on were a varnished wood with a red-toned color. My mother left me alone for about an hour to be spiritually cleansed. The pastor told me to sit on the chair against the wall, and no matter what I shouldn't move so that nothing bad happens, which was a little concerning to hear, but I did what he asked. He then started reading Bible scripture, and cursing me with names like evil spirit, devil, unworthy, etc. I don't think he called me by my name even once, and it all happened so fast. It was like suddenly I wasn't Dean anymore. I still felt the same, but it was like I was expected to know what was going on. He then yelled at me to start coughing, and I said how. I can't just cough when you say, but he ignored my words and kept repeating himself. So I tried to do what he said, I coughed and I accidentally spat in his face when trying to force out whatever he wanted. I think he saw this as intentional and continued what I would refer to as a homemade exorcism. After a while it was supposedly over and I was picked up by my mother, but I wasn't any better and things only got worse. Chapter 6, The Last Day and Grade 8 Towards the end of Term 3, I would attend what would end up being my last day at that school and receive my final suspension. By this time, I was very angry on the inside and desperately wanted to get back at some of the teachers, particularly the deputy principal. So that morning, before I was picked up by the school bus, I took a knife from the kitchen at home and kept it wrapped up in the bottom of my school bag. I had planned to wait until after school and see how the day went at first so I wasn't fully committed to hurting anyone yet. It was like I wanted to give them another chance, maybe they will be nice today. Unfortunately, the day didn't go so well, and we had an indoor school assembly at the end of the day. 
When we were seated inside the church hall, a student sitting beside me handed me what appeared to be one of the school sport gloves and said, I found this on the way in, what should I do with it? I responded, we should just give it to our class teacher, so it can be put back in the sports shed. Another student sitting to the other side of me overheard what was being said, and since he was within reach of our teacher, he offered to hand the glove in for us. So I handed him the glove, and he handed it to the teacher, but then we were told that the deputy principal wanted to see all three of us after assembly. At first I thought maybe we were getting a reward, after all we helped find and return school property. But when assembly was over, we were quite shocked to hear that what we did was wrong, and we were simply told the glove should have never entered the hall in the first place. I argued with him and stood up for my friends, but he wouldn't listen to any rational way of thinking, and he couldn't comprehend that the third boy and myself were only involved after the glove was brought into the hall. The result was, the guy who had the glove to begin with was on detention, and the other guy that handed over the glove was to receive two days of inner school suspension. But I was told I had to personally report to the deputy every morning before school from now on, and then I was to receive five days of inner school suspension, all over a single glove. I was furious and followed our deputy principal with my school bag and knife inside. Luckily, on this day, he was on bus duty in the afternoon, so though I was tempted, I remember hearing the kids around me, they were all playing and having fun, and I suddenly realized that they didn't deserve to see this. I stood in silence for some time, waiting to see if he would wander away, but then my bus arrived and when I got on I pulled out my knife and waved it to him from the window. Once I got home, my mother eventually discovered the knife, and I confessed everything to her. She decided that I was not going back to that school again, and this was slightly relieving, but my mind had become obsessed with hatred. I started becoming interested in much darker music, particularly the genre black metal, and my next biggest influence was a band called Cradle of Filth. I finished my fourth term of grade 7 at another local private school. I made some really good friends and my situation at the previous school had such an impact that I was told my friend, Brad, was also going to be enrolled at my new school as well the following year. I tried to be friends with as many people as I could and would often wander through different social groups during lunch breaks. I did a lot of silly or dangerous things at this time and it probably helped me gain respect or acknowledgement from my peers. I was generally known for two things at the time, the goth metal head and the karate kid, but I also had a habit of wanting to hurt myself. I tried to make it fun at first, like I would find a rusty nail on the ground and say, hey, do you reckon I could pierce me ear with this? I would then push the nail through the flesh of my earlobe. I also let my friends break stuff against my body, like sticks, large bits of plastic, glass light globes, etc. At the time, I thought it was fun and a great way of making friends, but it wasn't enough. I then started to self-harm, and I was very specific about doing it properly and believed the deeper I cut was either how sad I was or how much I deserved it. I was often influenced by the memories accompanied by certain sad songs that encouraged me to go deep. A few times I painted the entire bathroom sink from blue to a vibrant red, and it was like a trance that took away all sense of pain. My mother would often discover what I had done and take me to hospital where I would either get stitches or glued up, medicated and possibly sent to a psychiatric facility for a minimum of two weeks. On my father's property, we had a lot of wild cats living under the house and around the area, so to help keep the numbers down, I was given permission to use my grandfather's semi-automatic .22 rifle. I regretfully admit, I was so angry at the time, and would imagine the faces of all the teachers that hurt me on each animal I killed, and would sometimes dip my fingers inside the corpse and smear the blood around my body. It felt like this weird dream at the time, like I was completely numb. I remember the first time I ever killed an animal in front of someone was when my friend, Brad, came over. I stabbed an echidna directly through the spine and out the belly with a steel rod, except this time, when I looked up and saw my friend's face, 
I sort of snapped out of my trance, but felt immense guilt. The guilt and realization of what I had just exposed my friend to was horrifying, and I felt so embarrassed at the time, but I knew I couldn't go back. I felt like I didn't belong in this world anymore, so sadly, I kept going and had to suppress the guilt, suppress the shame, block out the dying sounds of this innocent living creature, and pretend I couldn't see what I knew was right in front of me. That was one of the worst feelings that still lingers inside me to this day. My first ever diagnosis was psychotic depression at the age of 13, made by two clinical psychologists, and that's when the prescription started. In total, over the next two years, I would be admitted 10 times to a psychiatric facility. Three of those times were to an adult mental health center called Banksia, located in Tamworth, NSW, and the other seven times were at Nexus in Newcastle, NSW. During my first admission to Nexus, I would write the lyrics to one of my earliest recordings. It was titled Screams, and it was later self-recorded and released under the band name, Deranged Insanity. Chapter 7, Vengeance The music and support I got from people was great, but I was still very angry and depressed. I might have seemed fine on the outside at times, but it felt incredibly cold and dark on the inside. In fact, this was the darkest year of my life, but it was also one of my favorites and most defining. I had plenty of friends and started sneaking alcohol on the weekends from the age of 14. I would have bonfires or go to one of my friend's houses quite often. I think my parents would let me have fun because they may have felt guilty for not believing me at the previous school. I also lost my virginity that year with one of the most attractive girls in our class. It was in the back of a Kingswood ute, in the middle of an open shed, which probably wasn't the best location, but it could have been worse. I mean, one of my friends also lost his virginity that night, except he was with his girlfriend in my dad's sheep shearing shed. I didn't actually expect him to go there when I suggested it, but he did. In many ways, that was the best year of my life mostly because of the people I met and knew at that time, but it was also the year I would try to kill myself. I couldn't step back at the time and be grateful that things might be getting better. I couldn't let go of my anger and pain, it all just felt so unfair. I couldn't stop thinking about my old teachers. So during class one morning, I simply walked out while everyone was busy doing their work. It was the first week of term two, because I knew that my old school started their holidays a week late, so I wandered across town in this trance-like state, and eventually arrived at my old school. I wrapped my school tie several times around my throat, stood on a ledge, and tied it to a metal barrier above me. My intention was to go out of this world the same way I came in, with a struggle. I then allowed myself to drop off the edge, and I remember wriggling my arms till they became too weak to hold, and the light faded from my eyes. All of a sudden, I wake up on the ground and assumed my tie must have broken at the last minute. I was very frustrated by this and felt like I had failed both life and death at the time. So I threw a rock at the window and was chased off the premises by a staff member that was preparing for the school to open the following week. I got away, but on my journey back to school, a police wagon pulls up and it's the youth police officer. He seemed nice at first but also caused a few problems in my life, and he was a Mormon, so, you know. Anyway, he takes me to my current psychologist and calls my mother before returning to investigate the scene. According to him, when he returned he told us that the school tie did not snap, but had been cleanly cut, as if with scissors. What actually happened would remain a mystery for the rest of my life. I finished most of year 8 until later in the year when my obsession for revenge would have a deep impact on who I would become. My biggest musical influence at the time was Cradle of Filth, but I also was fascinated by the history of a band called Mayhem. Particularly, the original singer known as Dead that slit his wrists with a serrated knife, then wrote a suicide note before shooting himself in the head with a shotgun on April 8, 1991, just two years and two days before I was born. I still had this scared, 
God-fearing child screaming inside of me. And although I did some dark things, it was that part of me that would hold me back from going further at times. I became aware of this, but the hatred for my old school was so persistent, I just couldn't let it go. So I made a plan, I would pray to Satan, and all the evil spirits to take control of my body for one night so I could burn down the school church hall. That day, I went into the sheep shearing shed and made my offering. The floor was stained with blood and dirt, and there was a stench somewhat comparable to death. I prayed to all the devils we had learnt about, made my request, cut myself, and then drank the drops of blood from my arm. There was a vision of darkness entering my wound that I was devouring with my blood. After that I was very calm for the rest of the day, and filled one of my father's chemical containers with petrol, before hiding it in the bushes for later. At around 2 a.m. that night, I quietly snuck out of bed, and even placed two pillows under my blankets to create the appearance I was still there. I grabbed the container I'd previously filled with over 20 liters of fuel and drove my dad's unregistered ute into town. I couldn't even get past second gear, so it was a long trip, but it felt like I was someone else. I spoke to the fuel container beside me, explaining its purpose like it could understand what I was saying. When I got into town, I drove straight across the highway and onto an open field between roads until I got to the back of the school. I remember turning my lights off because I didn't want anyone to see me, but luckily turned them on again before almost running into the back brick wall of a local pub or restaurant. I ended up parking the vehicle near the school and carried the fuel with me. I splashed it all around the church and even climbed up on the roof, splashing petrol everywhere, but luckily by the time I pulled out a box of matches and tried to ignite the fuel, it wouldn't. There was a constant breeze of wind and it was very foggy, setting moisture on every surface. If I had have successfully lit the church that day, I would have been burnt alive because I was standing right in the middle of everything. However, I wasn't very pleased with the outcome at the time, so since I had already come so far, I decided to kick in the air conditioner units on the roof with my leather, steel-capped rock boots. I caused what was later told to be at least $15,000 worth of damage. Unfortunately, I got a little carried away and made too much noise that would wake up a teacher the school had employed for security. He shined a flashlight right on me, and I froze with my foot half lodged in the unit like a cow looks at an oncoming truck before deciding to get out of there as fast as I could. I literally jumped straight off the building, over the fence, and into a deep ditch. I swear those thick leather boots were the only reason I never broke my ankle. Anyway, I kept running for the vehicle which was just on the other side of the car park, but I then saw the school security with his flashlight, so I dropped flat on the ground. I think I was hoping he just wouldn't notice me, but he suddenly started running around the car park, and he ran like the robot out of Terminator 2. That part actually freaked me out a little, so I realized he had seen me, and I get up, but I knew by the time I got to the ute he would catch me, so I ran the other way, and threw myself back into the ditch, holding my shirt over my face to try and hide my eye reflection. Surprisingly, it worked. I could see the light almost shining directly at me, but then I heard him say on a phone or radio, I've lost him. I felt so relieved for a moment and couldn't believe how stupid this guy was, but then he saw the ute, and I knew that was enough. I looked to my right, and there was a police wagon coming my way so I stood up, and walked over to the guy that was chasing me. I really should have waited probably just another minute, and turned myself into the police instead though, because when I went over to the guy he started screaming to get on the ground, so I did. He didn't even lay a finger on me, I put myself down, but he made up a heroic story about tackling me to the ground that everyone believed, and I would later hear back from other students.